Library at the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Library and Museum. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Uh, I would now going to turn, we have a special treat tonight, of someone special to introduce our special speaker. I'm going to introduce David Bloomberg, who is our speaker's son and a trustee of the library. Please welcome David Bloomberg. Thank you. As a trustee of the library, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight to hear our special guest local author speak. Um, Sanford Bloomberg has had a long and distinguished career, having practiced psychiatry in the Valley for over 35 years. And he continues in private practice today. As he says, he has patients who won't let him retire. In that time, he served as medical director of psychiatry and of the drug and alcohol treatment program at the Met Franklin Medical Center in Greenfield, as well as associate physician for psychiatry at Amherst College, clinical instructor at the Smith College School for Social, Social Work, adjunct professor at Westfield State College, and associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. He's also the former president of the Western Mass Psychiatric Association. I am also proud to say that he is my dad. <laughs> I worked for my father as a psychiatric aide at the Franklin Medical Center one summer during college. It was perhaps the most challenging and interesting job that I've ever had. Even then, in 1981, I knew that there was something special about the East Spoke which was the name, which was and is the name of the inpatient psychiatric unit at the Franklin Medical Center, then the Franklin County Public Hospital. It was created by my father and he ran it as medical director for over 20 years starting in 1969. And I understand we have some other guests here who, who worked there going back some of those years. The unit had no locks on the doors. Taking medication was voluntary on the part of the patients. And there was a patient government and all of the other benefits of what was called the therapeutic community. I was well aware back then how enlightened and progressive this facility was, especially compared to the state hospital down the road in Northampton at the time. What I did not know was how important these new community hospital-based facilities would become over the next 30 years. Um, as facilities such as the Northampton State Hospital were shut down. These facilities were pioneered by forward-thinking professionals such as my father, whose East Spoke was the first such utility, uh, facility in Western Mass. My father's book tells how these progressive, community-based treatment facilities eventually replaced the larger custodial care facilities such as the State Hospital. It also recounts the history of mental health treatment, or lack thereof, going back to the 1800s through the present day. And the story behind the reformers whose work led to the shutting down of the state hospital, and the resulting problem of lack of community-based care at the time for the former patients, who, some of whom found themselves on the streets of Northampton. I know you will find this story intriguing and will enjoy hearing it retold by someone who was there while it was happening and whose own work has helped thousands of people over all of these years. I am proud to introduce my dad, Dr. Sanford Bloomberg. I want to thank David for that very nice introduction. In the last page of the book, I also thank him for doing the final editing of my book. I've always felt that one reason why David's two brothers became physicians and David became a lawyer was because he worked on the East Spoke. I'm not sure if that's why. <laughs> but he was excellent. The nurses used to call all of my children up for one-on-one -on -one with particularly disturbed patients, including David used to be called up to sit with them. In any event, I want to thank all of you for being here, and particularly the people who are here with whom I've worked over the years. Carol Bisson in the Amherst Schools, three people that I've worked with on the, around the East Spoke. I really appreciate your all being here. What I would like to do tonight is to read sometimes brief excerpts from my book summarizing the history of Northampton State Hospital. I want to say, though, that the theme of this book, I've read everything available about Northampton State Hospital here in Forbes Library. 
No one has ever written anything like what I have because my theme is summarized in my subtitle, Phases in the Treatment and the Civil Rights of the Mentally Ill. In addition, no one has ever written about Northampton State Hospital from such a personal perspective as mine. And I'll be reading brief excerpts about my role there for two years. But let me begin by reading somewhat briefly from my introduction. The Northampton State Hospital, where I had the opportunity of working as a psychiatric physician for two years, beginning in September of 1969, was first known as the Northampton Lunatic Asylum. It wasn't until the year 2003 that the official name was changed from Northampton Lunatic Asylum to Northampton State Hospital. It opened in 1858 following the efforts of Dorothea Lynn Dix. She had been appalled when she visited a Massachusetts House of Correction in 1841 and denounced the wretched conditions under which the mentally ill were being incarcerated. She went on to launch her reform movement for more humane treatment to the mentally ill throughout the United States. She succeeded in the 1850s to get states to begin to build hospitals, quote, to get lunatics out of jails, poor houses, and attics. Dix's efforts led directly to the opening of the Northampton Lunatic Asylum in 1858. The judges and attorneys who were dismayed by what they considered the inhumane conditions <clears throat> in which they found patients at Northampton's Hospital Hill were as appalled in the 1970s by what they saw as was Dorothea Dix in 1841. Their concern led to the closing of Northampton State Hospital finally in 1993 through the consent decree the legal profession's demand for adequate treatment, quote, in environments which are the least restrictive. Northampton State Hospital was thus both opened and closed through the hard work of legal and social reformers. As I will argue in this history, the second set of reformers who came of age in the 1960s and 70s and finally achieved their goal in 1993 were less concerned with the well-being of the mentally ill and of loyal and faithful hospital employees than they were with the political and social problems of having a massive, underfunded, and poorly staffed mental institution under their jurisdiction. The initial political and social climate that pressed for the establishment of the Northampton Lunatic Asylum in 1858 informed but failed to anticipate the problems which helped to create the movement that closed the hospital in 1993. Until the opening of the McLean Asylum, now known as McLean Hospital near Boston in 1818, there was no public provision for the treatment of the mentally ill in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Soon after McLean Asylum opened, it was realized that more beds were needed, and in 1833, Worcester State Hospital was opened, followed by Taunton State Hospital in 1854. In 1854, the state legislature authorized the governor to appoint a committee, commission to examine the condition of the insane in the Commonwealth. In 1851, the state commissioners visited Northampton in an effort to find a suitable location for the third state hospital for the insane in Massachusetts. On October 26, 1855, the state purchased 172 acres of land in Northampton for $13,000. Construction began on March 15, 1856. On Independence Day of that year, the cornerstone of the hospital's main building, now affectionately known as Old Main, was laid, and the work continued until the completion in the spring of 1858. The approximate cost of constructing the hospital was $300,000. 
Then State Representative Erastus Hopkins of Northampton had given a long and eloquent statement emphasizing the beauty of the landscape and the morality and intelligence of the Northampton community, which was the reason why Northampton was chosen. At the time that the Northampton Asylum was built, there were only 37 public and private hospitals for the insane in the entire country. The hospital was the fourth built in Massachusetts. Connecticut did not have a state hospital until 1868. When Northampton Lunatic Asylum opened, Massachusetts had more hospital beds for the insane than any other state in the whole country. A review of the annual hospital reports tells us a great deal about the kind of treatment being given to the asylum's patients. The following entry from 1870 showed the gradual acceptance of medication. Quote, this brief epitome comprehends the whole of the therapeutics of insanity, tonics, stimulants, cathartics. The new remedy, hydrate of chloro, now known as chlorohydrate, still available in pharmacies, was first used in 1832. However, the physicians taking care of patients were convinced that there was no drug specific for disordered minds. So these were merely sedatives. The hospital was open with the then relatively new treatment called moral treatment. Moral treatment in the middle 1800s was based on the conviction that lunatics, quote, lunatics could be restored to sanity if they were extracted from negative and oppressive environments and put into programs which encouraged their innate capacity to reason through the discipline of education and useful activity. With uh, proper care, the self-respect which evaded so many mental patients would be restored and with it a respect for them. That was moral treatment. Conditions at, at the Northampton Lunatic Asylum began deteriorating for a number of reasons. One of the books I read was a doctoral dissertation by a Kathleen McCarthy, who wrote this dissertation for her PhD in sociology at the University of Michigan in 1974. McCarthy, like other sociologists in the 60s and 70s, were very critical of all mental institutions. She called her dissertation on Northampton a different perspective on this colossal failure. Her view, she claims, is based on the reading of the records of the Northampton Lunatic Hospital from its opening in 1858 to the retirement in 1885 of its last superintendent interested in moral treatment. Those who were admitted to Northampton in the early days, and now I'm referring to the civil rights of mentally ill people, those who were admitted to Northampton in the early days were the unwanted, the illiterate, the aliens of Massachusetts. Once interred, they lived in quiet despair and were forgotten. In the dismissive sweep of the so-called arbitrary, arbitrary nature of mental hospitalizations, who were the hospitalized? According to Kathleen McCarthy in her doctoral dissertation, the majority of patients admitted between 1858 and 1892 were Irish first-generation immigrants more of them women than men. The lives they led before and after entering the hospital she described as drunken and dissipated. In the hospital records that she examined, there was no reason why they were admitted to the hospital. So the civil rights of people were being violated when the unwanted of society were sent to Northampton State Hospital. And some of that still went on, even in the 20th century. The civil rights of patients, what is distinctive about my book is the phases in the treatment and in the civil rights. No one has ever written about Northampton State Hospital from that point of view. 
The civil rights of patients were getting attention. The Massachusetts State Legislature in 1832 and in 1858 said that only the furiously and dangerously mad and the threat to the community committed by a probate judge were supposed to be hospitalized. The affirmation that the state had the responsibility of caring for the mentally ill was in this law. But the commitment laws were being evaded. The poor, the homeless, the unwanted of society continued to be sent to the state hospital. Throughout the 19th century, both doctors and laymen understood mental illness. They really didn't understand it. They understood mental illness as a reciprocation of the illness of society because of the morality and pressures of living in society, they felt that was the cause of mental illness. Of course, they knew nothing about the physiological and organic changes in the brain that take place with people who are mentally ill. But because they felt society was responsible for a mental illness, that made government responsible for taking care of the mentally ill. That was the social policy. The reputation for deterioration of care and poor care became just terrible, but it remains unfair to place the blame for the state of affairs on the poor quality of care administered by medical staff. They were administering treatments which were the most highly regarded at the time, but no one knew anything about mentally, mental illness then. The staff was devoted to the patients under their care. This was well documented in a book by J. Michael Moore. I assume he's not here. He wrote a book called The Life and Death of Northampton State Hospital, published by Historic Northampton in 1893. This, there is a significant history of reform and progress and treatment being out of the hands of medical personnel. In the last half of the 19th century, a highly inflationary cycle raised the cost of institutions. Legislatures were reluctant to appropriate necessary funds. In the first half of the 20th century, bureaucratic mismanagement led to swelling populations at state hospitals, understaffing, a focus on the huge physical structures, and therefore, no treatment was taking place, only custodial care. An example of the custodial care that I witnessed when I worked at Northampton State Hospital in the outpatient department in 1969 was an experience that the newspaper reported, if those of you read the article yesterday. I feel it's important to discuss my personal experiences as a staff member at Northampton State Hospital. Again, I began working on September 1, 1969. <clears throat> Under the sponsorship of the Department of Mental Health, my duties included establishing a community mental health program that provided psychiatric consultation to the Amherst schools, Northampton schools, Hatfield, and all the hill towns. My job was 20 hours a week, and I would spend much of that time in schools. And Carol Bisson from the Amherst schools remembers my being there very well. Thank you. <laughs> I worked one day a week in the state hospital outpatient department and I delivered lectures once a week to the medical staff and to uh, nurses and all this, the attendants. Following one such conference, admission conference, where I had a lot to say about the treatment and what should, uh, what should happen with a newly admitted patient I based my knowledge on the very latest, very latest information that I learned in the Detroit area where I was trained and practiced before I came here. The chief psychologist had a rage reaction at me after a conference. He screamed at me, you're nothing but a big know-it-all from Detroit, he said to me. 
because he wasn't interested, and the medical staff wasn't interested <coughs> in treatment. They were only interested in custodial care. Following that incident, the medical staff and psychologists never attended any of my lectures, but the lectures were always well attended by nurses and the psychiatric attendants and the social workers who were interested to learn more about diagnosis and treatment. I quoted at great length in my book from a social historian, David Rothman, who wrote about custodial care. And my experience confirmed David Rothman's thesis. Custodial care was all that was happening at Northampton State Hospital. This situation con uh, continued because I also discuss phases in the treatment of the mentally ill, particularly medications. All of this continued until Thorazine, the antipsychotic, was introduced in 1952, and a number of derivatives followed that. These were the first pharmacological agents for the treatment of psychosis. Before that time, patients were treated by bloodletting, cathartics, ice baths, spinning chairs, because the concept of mental illness in the 1800s and even in the early 20th century, the only way to get mental illness out of people was by aggressively forcing it out of their bodies by these physical treatments, terrible inhumane treatments. But when we began having medications, uh, the antipsychotic medication replaced the sedatives and other things they were using. <clears throat> there was a drug that was used before Thorazine called Reserpin. Reserpin is a drug for high blood pressure. And when I was a senior medical student at the University of Vermont Medical School, my rotation for a month at the Waterbury State Hospital, all schizophrenics were being treated with Reserpin, which lowered blood pressure and was very, very sedating and had nothing, did nothing for psychosis. Amipramine, the first antidepressant, was introduced in 1957, followed by many others in the 1960s and then later, and we have better and better ones now. Librium and the benzodiazepine family, Valium, and drugs, uh, tranquilizers of that kind. But the first drugs in the 1950s and 60s was a drug called Equinil, Milltown. It was a muscle relaxant. It wasn't a tranquilizer, but it was a muscle relaxant. So medications shorten hospital stay. David Rothman, the social historian, details the deteriorating conditions in state hospitals in the 70s leading to the appalling conditions in the treatment and quality of life of Northampton's patients. Rothman's description of the poor treatment and conditions prevalent in state hospitals only partly applies to Northampton. That's why he referred to Northampton as being state of the art. The most advanced treatment he felt was taking place at Northampton State Hospital. Northampton was located in a lovely setting on the edge of a small community, he writes, not near a large city. And then uh, Michael Moore in his book about the employees talked about uh, many employees work, who worked on Hospital Hill, lived on the grounds in large dormitories. In 1955, there were 2,500 patients at Northampton State Hospital and uh, over 600 employees, cultivating hundreds of acres of ground. The extended families of the employees often lived on the hospital grounds. A family feeling was created by a wonderful rapport between patients and staff. Whole families have been employed at the hospital for generations. And, he, and Michael Moore describes the aspects of the patient-staff interaction and the importance of the hospital to the community of Northampton. Hospital was the largest employer in Northampton. <clears throat> 
Actually, deinstitutionalization began in the early 1970s. What I did was review everything that the Hampshire Gazette has ever written about Northampton State Hospital for the last hundred years. And there was an article on May 31st, 1972 in the Gazette that reported the National Institute of Mental Health awarded Northampton State Hospital $500,000 to be paid out over five years to establish an incentive community to help chronically ill patients adjust socially and economically back in the real community. Also in the early 1970s, geriatric patients began being discharged to nursing homes. They really didn't have to be at a state hospital. The mentally retarded were being discharged to placements in the community and to the state schools, which have since closed for the mentally retarded. So during the 1970s, the census declined by about two-thirds. An article in the Gazette on March 29, 1976, reported the Department of Mental Health <clears throat> was proposing to replace the unlicensed foreign-trained physicians who had been employed at the hospital for 15 years without medical licenses. So patients at the hospital were being treated by people who could, some of them could hardly speak English, and they really didn't have any psychiatric training. So the care wasn't very good. At the time, in the 1970s, late 1970s, only two hospitals, only two doctors were employed at the hospital who were fully licensed. So deinstitutionalization began to take place in the 1970s. The scene, custodial care, was that motivated the legal profession to close the hospital was graphically described to me by a dear friend, Steve Ahrens. Steve Ahrens is an attorney at law who is a professor in the Department of Legal Studies at the University of Massachusetts. He wrote this piece for me that I quote. It was in 1974 or early 1975 when a student of mine requested an independent study dealing with civil commitment laws, laws individual liberty and treatment for emotional disorders. Her idea was we would attend commitment hearings. So Steve began taking his students over there and he recalled going to a hearing held on the lock wards of the hospital. At that time, the population of Northampton State Hospital was about 1,000, and there were very few therapists of any kind and only two psychiatrists. Then he writes at the end of his account, on this particular Wednesday, the judge surprised me. Halfway along our slow journey through those mental decompression chambers that mark the inner reaches of the hospital, the judge turned to me and said, I wish someone would make a movie of this hospital and show it every night on television until they close this place down. And that's exactly what happened. In December of 1976, the Center for Public Representation filed a class action lawsuit for the benefit of patients at Northampton State Hospital. It became known as the Brewster versus Dukakis Civil Action, the so-called consent decree. The plaintiff was a David Brewster, a patient at the hospital, and defendant was Michael Dukakis, then governor. He, the patient represented all mentally disabled persons who were, as of December 15, 1976, in the hospital or might be in the hospital. The court claimed jurisdiction of the subject matter, citing previous court decisions and the court certified this matter as a class action. And after an enormous amount of debate and submissions filed by both parties, the consent decree was issued on December 6, 1978. Then I have a chapter on the impact of the consent decree on the staff and the community. Many of the non-medical staff had worked for decades at the hospital. They devoted their careers and their lives with devotion to the patients. 
and they began losing their jobs. And, and as Michael Moore reports, even their identities. They were also horribly concerned about the welfare of their patients who were being discharged without adequate community resources. Michael Moore writes that in his life and death in Northampton State Hospital, it closed and worked in economic hardship on the employees of the hospital. Some were able to take advantage of an early retirement program, but many did not have the time of service or were too young to qualify. So a lot of people became unemployed. The closing of the state hospital gave rise to a struggle for control of the almost 600 acres, actually 573, of hospital land, which became unused and underutilized as the hospital was closing. In 1978, there were only 400 patients left in the hospital. A bill in 1980 in the state legislature in Boston proposed a three-member property management authority be convened to dispose of surplus state property. In April of 1980, a 36-member Blue Ribbon Commission on the Future of Public Inpatient Mental Health Services, convened by the State Commissioner of Mental Health, commented on whether the state could close its hospitals. It said conditions at Northampton State Hospital are not suitable for long-term patient care. Patients needed to be transferred to the community. But the consent decree did not have sufficient provisions for the creation of community programs. It really depended on private units and general hospitals. In the 70s, mine was the only one in Greenfield, and it took at least, oh, almost 10 years before the other hospitals had some. The mayor of New Northampton appointed a client services advisory committee. Incidentally, I had forgotten I was on this committee until I was quoted, read a quote that I said. I was, I was interviewed in the Hampshire, by a reporter from the Hampshire Gazette um, to, to speak for the committee after one of our meetings. The Client Services Advisory Committee was concerned about the moving patients from the state hospital to community programs, which many of which did not exist. A dozen persons were on the committee, representative of different fields. They included individuals from the Smith College School for Social Work, Hampshire County House of Correction, the medical director of the psychiatric programs at the Franklin Medical Center, me. <laughs> and Gail Perlman, is Gail here tonight? A probate judge? At that time, Gail was a lecturer at Smith College and as you may know, she was a wonderful social worker too. And she was on that committee, a pharmacist and another attorney. In the article, I'm quoted as speaking for the committee. I said in the paper, there is an extreme concern about the system not working out and the injustice to people in need of care. The Gazette article also quoted another member of the committee Merton Burt, the deputy master of the Hampshire County House of Correction, who told the reporter that mentally ill people were ending up incarcerated instead of in the hospital. I remember incidents that I don't write about, but I remember incidents whenever the weather got cold, a lot of these mentally ill people on Main Street in Northampton would throw a brick through a glass window on Main Street in order to get their food and a warm bed at the Hampshire County House of Correction. And that's what the sheriff reported. Okay. The opening and closing of Northampton State Hospital can best be understood through an understanding of how the treatment of the mentally ill interacted with the influence of progressive social policy and the legal rights of the mentally ill. What has been referred to as the driving force behind the closing of Northampton State Hospital civil rights has been forcibly, forcibly described in madness in the streets, how psychiatry and the law abandoned the mentally ill. Madness in the streets, when it was published, documents how the mental health bar had concentrated so much on, quote, closing the place down, 
through the consent decree rather than sustaining the population of the state hospital. It did not push for such care programs with anything like the zeal it directed at depopulating the hospital. One must grant that these criticisms of civil rights policy overriding the needs of the mentally ill persons for medical <laughs> treatment of their illness may be overly harsh condemnations of the legal profession. In fact, though, the perspective of those whose family members suffered the consequences justified the criticism. Madness in the Street, that book was brought to my attention at a meeting on the 10th anniversary of the closing of Northampton State Hospital at Cooley Dickinson Hospital in 2003. At that time, Jane Mosier and Claire Overlander, the past and present executive director of the National Alliance for Mental Illness of Western Massachusetts, they learned that I might be thinking about the history and they wanted me to, they loaned me Madness in the Street, to quote from. Finally, Northampton State Hospital was able to close when its last 11 patients requiring continued inpatient hospitalization in a secure setting were transferred on August 26, 1993 to the psychiatric unit at the Springfield Municipal Hospital. Finally, I want to mention the referendum on the ballot in Northampton on November 4, 2003. A resident, Michael Kirby, approached the city council to put the matter on the ballot. He wanted to learn what citizens of Northampton wanted to be done and what they wanted done in the development of the village at Hospital Hill. The first ballot question asked voters to approve or reject phase two of the project, 158 housing units, 324,000 square feet of commercial development. Question two on the ballot, Ask voters to approve or reject minimal roof repairs to save Old Main from further deterioration. Mayor Clara Higgins and all but one city council members advocated for question one. The result of the ballot was question one passed with 60% of the vote and question two to save Old Main was defeated by 60% of the vote. So with the development of the village at Hospital Hill in that referendum of 2003, my history of Northampton State Hospital comes to an end. I'll be happy to listen to any comments any of you have or if you have any questions. The only mistake about it was that people were being, patients were being discharged without adequate community resources. Northampton became well known for its mentally ill people wandering around Main Street. Uh, it really depended upon the opening of psychiatric units and private general hospitals, and there were none at first. So the only mistake about it was that, as described in Madness in the Streets, there should have been more focus upon more adequate community care before patients were discharged from the hospital. So, but in a sense, it led to much better treatment in general hospitals, much better treatment. Do you think there was a concern about hospitals like that in generations? I don't think so. No, I think. Uh, units in private general hospitals are really fulfilling that function. Patients are being committed there. In the 1980s, as David remarked, we didn't have any locked doors on the East Spoke. It wasn't until the 1990s, after the closing of the hospital, that patients would be committed to the private general hospital units. Yeah. I don't think there were any changes in 
in uh, society. Society was considered responsible for mental illness. Um, one of the examples that I read was that the pressure on young people for upward mobility and for education and achievement was felt to be one of the causes of severe mental illness. But obviously, there was no scientific knowledge of the organic brain damage, physiological changes in the brain, not only uh, manic depressive illness and schizophrenia, but even anxiety disorders. And incidentally, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is genetic. It runs in families. There was no awareness in those days that that was the real cause of mental disorders. And I, don't, I didn't read by the social historian any efforts to change society. Well, the, the, there weren't enough therapists at the state hospital, certainly in the community, the School for Social Work. In the, in the 80s, there were more and more well-trained social workers at the state hospital, but certainly not in the uh, 50s and 60s, before that time. When you got there, there were very few trained therapists there? Uh, there were one or two who were very good that I hired from my psychiatric unit away from the state hospital. Because there wasn't any provision at the state hospital for psychotherapy. No one was spending psychotherapy with patients. That's because it was understaffed. There were too many patients there. There was that so-called incentive community that I, that I reported on that uh, began employing some of the patients at the hospital. Oh, incidentally, in my book, I mentioned, but I didn't read about it. <clears throat> when I was in Michigan at the state hospital during my residency, the most successful, we had medications, of course, but the most successful therapy we had was a work, work program where patients worked at the general hospital at our hospital, but weren't paid. But they worked on these jobs, and as a reward, were given leaves of absences. A law was passed by the reformers in the 1970s, eliminating work therapy, feeling that patients should be paid if they worked at the hospital. But, but certainly in the, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, and Patients in the incentive community program at the hospital were paid for doing uh, small jobs at the hospital. And that was, don't forget, the worst result of custodial care was the loss of all social skills, personal hygiene skills, uh, interacting with other people was lost. As Steve Ahrens describes beautifully for me, the people that he saw in the back words were like zombies, over-medicated, staring into space. And as a result, so many custodial care people lost any ability to live in society. But the incentive community in the 70s began training people to go back into the community. It was a therapeutic community where patients would um, hold group meetings, decide on who was well enough to leave the hospital on the weekend, uh, assign chores to each other. 
we also did an awful lot of family therapy and stuff there. There was a lot of therapy done. And, and what, what's the kind of psychiatric medical background to that kind of approach? What led to the establishment of that kind of a There was a man by the name of Maxwell Jones who wrote a book on therapeutic community, how to deal with patients in mental hospitals, and that's what we did there. But ours was the only program in the whole area. Yeah. Members of the staff are here tonight. I'm sure you remember that. That's our therapeutic community. It was so effective. But they just weren't doing anything like that at the state hospital. Is there a problem now with continuing that kind of care in that environment of therapeutic communities because of the restraints of the insurance companies and, and so on? Has that affected the quality of care in that kind of setting? Oh, that, that's certainly true. Insurance companies don't let patients stay very long, a matter so, of days. So would it be hard to do what they're doing then now? Used to have people stay for months, for many months sometimes. There was a question, someone, yes. Oh, yeah, no. Hospital. Oh, at, at the state hospital? No, I, I didn't work on the inpatient wards of the state hospital. I just worked in the outpatient department, and then my chief job was to set up a commune uh, by consulting in all the schools in the whole area. So you were sort of going into the hospital to get information? Oh, the only time I went into the hospital was when I attended the admission conferences. And I had a lot to say about how these people should be treated, but they weren't interested. So they didn't have the staff to do it. These are all accounts of people that you've met. The book is accounts of people that you've met? I only mentioned the chief psychologist who screamed at me, who had a rage <laughs> I, I, I didn't mention the other, anybody else. No. That, that you were director. You were director of the maintenance right. program, yeah. Right. Incidentally, one of the things I didn't mention was one of the reasons for the inadequate care in the community was the refusal of the state hospital to release parts of its budget to set up community programs. David Rothman, the social historian, mentions this because they, they needed to maintain the money for their own maintenance. So there was no money for the community programs for that reason. Each of the five uh, counties. Just threw everybody out into the wards. I was on wards where the urinal was filled with concrete. This is the plumbing was so bad. Yeah. 
just yeah. the bond situation, right? Yeah. That was basically unitization was the money flow. We put you into the units of where the money is. We didn't care about that. Yeah. But we had worked in it here. Yeah. No, I, I mentioned briefly in my book, each of the counties had its own unit at that time. Yes. Oh, well, I, I think there's a lot of recent psychiatric literature that really encourages psychotherapy as well as medications. For instance, they say that therapy called cognitive therapy, changing your intellectual perceptions of things for anxiety is as effective as medication is. But also, I think we've learned over the years that behavior and the way that one deals with stresses in the environment influences your neurotransmitters as a physiological response in your brain. So it's so important, I was quoted, my article yesterday was quoted, it's so important to know what's going on emotionally, to know what stresses are in a person's life, because that, what's going on in their life and the way they deal with it influences any response to medication. So therapy is so important. Uh, depression. Our literature really encourages cognitive therapy for the treatment of depression, because so many people are resistant to our medications, that they need psychotherapy. Oh, no, no. No, I, I just talked about the state hospital itself. No. No, this is not a book about therapy. It's just a history of the state hospital. But there's no question that um, our psychiatric literature in recent years really is focusing more and more on the interaction between our medications and the need for therapy along with medications. One of my criticisms of my colleagues, however, is that a lot of psychiatrists, some psychiatrists at least, spend five or 10 minutes in their medication visits, re-prescribing the same medications without finding out what's going on in the lives of their patients. And therefore, the people I see, for instance, for disability have been treated for years by their psychiatrists and are still very symptomatic because psychiatrists really should focus more upon what's going on in the lives of their patients, not only writing prescriptions for medication.
Well, certainly our medications today are much more effective than, in, than even back in the 70s and 80s. And the problem is for people who don't have health insurance. I, I've seen people, for instance, uh, for disabilities who have no health insurance, who desperately need medications and can't afford the medications. So I think in the, from that point of view, there is a certain number of people that you're very right about who just don't have adequate insurance, adequate funding to take care of them. So many people without health insurance. And yet, uh, well, the Massachusetts just passed a law that's going to make health, care, health insurance almost universal. And I think we've needed that for a long, long time. Yeah. Oh, I think that that's one of our legal responsibilities, to be always aware of that and to make people aware of it. But lots of people don't have those side effects. But, but certainly some do. And we have to be very much aware of that, and the, the patient has to be very much aware of that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.